Our next speaker is uh, Professor Ian Golden, who is going to address the topic of, is the world full? Uh, Professor Golden uh, um, is the director of the Oxford Martin School, which was established by uh, way of a magnificent bequest made by uh, James Martin back in the middle part of the last decade. After the bequest was made, Professor Golden was um, hired by the university away from his then position as one of the six vice presidents of the World Bank. At the World Bank, I believe he had, particular, he had responsibility for the World Bank's relationship uh, with the United Nations, as well as with a number of major countries in the world, not the least of them being uh, his homeland of South Africa. Ian is a fellow of Balliol College, and I know, Ian, we're all fascinated to hear your prognosis about whether it is or isn't full. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir John. It's a great pleasure to be here and uh, to be able to talk to a group of students that were here as Rhodes Scholars and many of the alum and to think about this question of, is the planet full? I, I do want to take this opportunity also uh, to thank Sir John, not only for recruiting me uh, to what I think has been the most wonderful job I've ever had, uh, but also because he was absolutely instrumental in the creation of the Oxford Martin School um, in 2005. The Oxford Martin School is a group now of over 300 academics in Oxford working in interdisciplinary teams to address many of the greatest challenges of the 21st century. And it's this very diverse group of people that came together in a series of workshops and seminars to address this question. And the question of, is the planet full, is rather typical of many of the questions facing the planet, which is that it cannot be addressed by one particular discipline alone. It cannot be addressed from a silo uh, of any type, from demography or economics or nutrition, medicine, politics, uh, climate or any other. It requires interdisciplinary thinking and so we were very privileged to have some leading scholars across the school working on many of the dimensions of this and so we ran a series of workshops uh, culminating uh, in the edited volume I uh, did Is the Planet Full which brings together 10 of the academic professors, directors of the different groups across the school to address this question. Now, what, what became very rapidly apparent is that this is a very old question. Indeed, uh, there's historical evidence that it's a question that's been asked for at least 2,000 years. Indeed, uh, we have citations in the book from the second century where people are complaining when the world's population was about 150 million uh, that the planet was already too full. Uh, of course, it's something that was picked up aggressively by Darwin in the 18th century, sorry, by Malthus in the 18th century, uh, and we know the dimensions of that debate that is inevitable as population growth continues that there will be immiseration. And this was picked up uh, by Darwin later, and we see it in a lot of literature as well, not least in Dickens, where there's this perpetual theme often articulated by Scrooge and by others about how pestilence and famine will keep populations down. And then it took until the 1960s until there was really an active debate and a whole group of people and institutions like the one that started in Rome that led to the Limits to Growth book uh, that began to really question what is this. Now some of you are from Australia and will be aware that population density there is about three people uh, per square kilometre and some of you might be from a place like Singapore where it's 7,000 uh, people per square kilometre. Uh, and there's very little evidence that the question can be addressed by the population density. Simply, are there too many people in any one place? Indeed, one of the real success stories of recent years has been that as people come together, they get wealthier. Indeed, if one does the econometrics, the correlations of population density and wealth creation, you see that there's a very strong correlation between as people come together, 
they get wealthier. They don't get wealthier because, and then move to cities, they get wealthier because they're in cities. And so we see around the world, part of the explanation for the extraordinary rapid income growth of recent decades has been increasing population density. People coming together and basically able to do things that they could not do in a more dispersed way. This is both about getting the things they need, the health, the education, and the other types of resources to improve themselves, but also to getting the ideas they need more rapid creative destruction happens in dense areas. There's a more rapid exchange of ideas. And, of course, one gets, as one's creating new ideas, others to work with. One can build teams. One can find the people you need, the skills you need, the inputs you need, the materials you need. And, of course, you can find the markets you need, the people to give things to, to sell things to, to share ideas with. And so we see up to population densities of about 10 million people, very rapid improvements in income, and then various diseconomies of scale start to play off. Pollution effects, congestion effects, you no longer get added benefits. Although increasing diversity, even within very large populations, does lead to continued economic growth, and you only need to look to places like London to get a sense of that, that as London has become more diverse, it's become more vibrant. And this isn't a new story, this is one that is written over a 300 year history of London. It's also the case that big places aren't the most unhappy places, or population density is not associated with unhappiness. Indeed, there's a lot of evidence that some of the happiest people on earth are those living in mega cities. Toronto, for example, has just won the award as the happiest city. Um, it's the most diverse, over 50% migrant, but it's also, of course, a very big city. And within the UK, we know that this is true of London. So what is it that would lead us to lead to thinking that the planet might be full? Well, it's increasing extremely rapidly, about another billion people over the past 20 years or so. It's going through its most rapid increase period. And there's some evidence that we're running out of things. There's also evidence that the effect of population growth has been increasingly destruction on the planet and our common resources. So it's not really about how many people there are, it's about what they do. It's how we live, our consumption patterns, the spillover effects of our success in many cases. If we have many billions of poor people living in Africa, the thing that we worry about there is dire poverty and famine. But even in that case, there's very little evidence that population growth and is associated with famine or disease. That is an idea, which is obviously popular with Malthus and Darwin and others, which has been discredited. Because there are so many counterfactual examples. And Amartya Sen, the brilliant economist and polymath who won the Nobel Prize in his book Poverty and Famine, amongst other people who have shown this, demonstrates that there's no relationship between poverty and famine. It's about political economy. It's about access, it's about price, it's about distribution, it's about many things, but it's not simply related to how poor people are. And this is true of health as well. There are many counterexamples around the world of extremely poor people living in reasonable health, if the society permits it. So, in terms of does poverty or does the number of people necessarily lead to miseration, there's a big debate. There's also quite a lot of evidence that they don't, poor people don't destroy the planet, at least not as quickly as wealthier people do. The spillover effects of individual decisions are smaller the lower the levels of income. This is true up to about $3,000 per capita. But after that, as people transition 
from about $3,000, say £2,000 per capita, up to about $20,000 per capita. They go through a peak transformation period where every improvement in their incomes leads to greater and greater impact on others. And that's because they increase their consumption of food, energy, transport systems, infrastructure, and also other things which have spillover effects, like, for example, antibiotics. Now, it's rational for us all as individuals to take an antibiotic and to give it to our loved ones. But if seven pe billion people do that, they will be ineffective. And this is a very classic example of what economists call the tragedy of the commons. The difference between individual rationality and that of society, or between individual choice and collective outcomes. And it's this issue which is really at the heart, our book would argue, at, of the question of whether the planet is full. It's not how many people there are, it's are we able to manage ourselves? Are we able to manage particularly the unintended consequences of our success? Are we able to ensure that the choices we make are consistent not only with our own well-being and progress, but of those of the rest of the global citizens? Or is, there, is this a zero-sum game in some respect? Are there trade-offs? Is it that if we succeed, necessarily we destroy the planet for others? And here, income does matter. If you take something, most risks apply principally and most aggressively to poor people. Most wealthy people can insulate themselves from risk, whether it's climate change, financial crises, or others. They suffer, certainly, but they don't die. There's one exception to this, of course, and that's pandemics. Pandemics kill kings and queens as they do poor people. And so when we look across what the implications of our actions are, there are certain things which will be highly differentiated in terms of the spillover effects. And climate change is certainly one of them. Food price instability is another. Pollution tends to be, and many other things. Antibiotic resistance and pandemics will affect us all equally. So, we can think about this question as a question as to are we able to find new ways of improving wealth with less spillover effect. This tragedy of the commons is a very old problem for philosophers and economists and others. It happened here in Oxford when people shared our Port Meadow. And as the number of people that did that grew in number, and the number of goats and other animals that they were putting on the meadow increased. It become a, a, became unsustainable. So rules, regulations, elders that imposed time limits on how many cattle or goats could be on the fields, when, those sorts of rules and regulations were developed here in Oxford and around the world in villages and communities as they were regarding fishing from rivers and all other use of common resources. But over time, as the market has increasingly determined our choices, as we've getting, got into bigger and more complex societies, as we've begun to believe more and more that individual freedoms and choices are what define our progress, these common rules bind us less and less, not only here, but around the world. Indeed, one of the objects of income growth and wealth is that we have more choice. We are more able to choose what we do, how we do it, where we do it. And so that's progress. And it's this tension between our choices and the implications that becomes absolutely critical in thinking about the question. So can seven billion people all consume, like us, in terms of our carbon emissions and our food, 
and everything else? And the answer is certainly that that is unlikely to be sustainable. Can they take as many antibiotics as we take? And the answer is with current technologies in medicine that is likely to be unsustainable. Can they fly as much as I fly? I think if one small proportion of the world did that, they would destroy the planet. So our individual choices become the question. And so when we think about this question, we need to think about the ethics and the intergenerational equity. Now Toby Ord and Tony Atkinson in the book talk a lot about ethics. And this is a very difficult question. Do we make choices that restrict the rights of others effectively? And how do we do that? And what is our obligation, if any, to future generations? Do we have one? And what do we care about? Do we care about the marginal welfare or the total welfare of the world? If one more person would add to the sum of human happiness and welfare, should that person be welcomed? And more broadly, we can think about what drives progress and what drives innovation. If we're saying we think that population growth should be stopped, are we saying let's put a limit on the number of Mozarts or Einsteins or others that are yet to come? And one of the most extraordinary and wonderful aspects of the world we live in now is that education and connectivity around the world have meant that there is this explosion of creativity, of opportunity. If you believe in the random distribution of extraordinary talent, which I do, then they're just more people, educated and connected. So we will see more innovation and progress. There's a big debate about this, which I'm locked into with people like Peter Thiel, who believe that innovation is slowing down. But I believe we're in a new renaissance, a period which will see extraordinary flourishing and that it's already started. There's also, I believe, extraordinary progress that comes out of cross-learning, societies that learn from each other more rapidly, and we see that with globalization today. The rate of change, and that's another explanation for why there's been such rapid progress. Societies like China, India, and many others are throwing out old ideas and taking on new ideas more rapidly. So this question, and I'm going to stop now because I would like to leave some time for discussion. This question, as we see it in the book, requires multifaceted answers. We also need to think very carefully about where populations are coming from. One of the astounding things that I've found, and Sarah Harper talks about that, who runs our Institute of Population Dynamics and Aging in the school, is demography, which I used to think of as a science, I now regard rather as I regard economics. It's really more an art than a science. The demographers can't agree whether the world's population in 2050 will be 8 billion or above 15. That's 36 years away. The range of uncertainty, which is over 60% of the world's current population. Quite extraordinary because they can't agree on two key questions. How quickly fertility is coming down, particularly in Africa. It's coming down dramatically and over half the population, half the countries in the world are already below replacement level. And how much longevity will improve. Just while I'm with you for 30 minutes, on average, our life expectancy should improve by about six minutes. That's the pace of progress that's happening. But the balance between that and neuroscience and degenerative neuro problems, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementia, and the fertility collapse creates another question. And that is, in the year 2050, if we were having this conversation, I really don't know whether the conversation would be about too many or too few people. It could well be that particularly we don't have enough young people, people who will keep us going in our old age. So it's an open debate, it's a fascinating debate, and it's one that I think is of absolute central importance, not only to all of our lives and the future of the planet, 
but also to how we make choices around many of the things we do on an everyday basis. Thank you. I think your point is uh, extremely well made and is absolutely right. Uh, interestingly enough that as one looks forward, the question of gender is going to become more and more significant. One of the really worrying tendencies that happens is that as societies come down below replacement level and many people only have one child and the technologies become ubiquitous as to whether they have a boy or a girl. Um, gender selection of, 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 of babies uh, and the societies reward boys more than girls through status, career prospects, income and so forth. Many societies are having many more boys than girls. So you know there are already provinces in China where there are 13 boys for every 10 girls at the age of one. But this isn't only a um, a Chinese problem. This is a global phenomenon uh, where there's increasing bias in favor of boys. Not as marked, but it's increasing. So the pressure, and then of course you get a vicious downward spiral. Too few women, less babies, and, and fertility collapses even more rapidly. This is one of the reasons the demographers also have high levels of uncertainty uh, regarding the future. So creating uh, non-gender biased societies I think is going to be absolutely vital to address some of the major imbalances that are going to happen in gender as well as the prospects of societies. Now, the other point, point is that demographic windows are closing everywhere in the advanced economies. They're firmly slammed shut in most of Europe. Uh, of course, what you can do is release into the society half the population, women. Uh, who are often excluded. This, by the way, also relates to a whole other debate which I didn't touch on, which is migration, which I'm passionate about. Um, one of the, the, the strong bits of evidence coming out of the US is that migrants have released women into the workforce by doing jobs like childcare uh, and others at home. And so that women participation in the workforce is strongly positively related uh, to migration. So it's interesting. And then, of course, there's the basic ethical and other question, which is women are equal to men, and therefore, of course, they should have equal rights. So I think you're absolutely right, and it's going to become increasingly important. Yes.
and the growth of the actual plants in the two adjacent areas is absolutely quite amazing. So one really chat and one piece is the possibility that soil fertility is going down and quality of foods will deteriorate as well. Comment? Well, this is way outside my uh, competence area. Um, Within the Oxford Martin School, we have a number of groups that work on this. One is led by um, Professor Charles Godfrey, who has a chapter in the book, who runs our Future of Food and Farming group. Uh, and another one, which I think is germane to this question, is that of Yadvinda Mali, who runs our forest group, uh, who writes on the metabolism, the interaction of soil and, um, and food. And one of the things that, that, that I learned from his chapter is talking about dung and the role of dung in and nutritional cycles uh, in soils. Um, I think there's, there's, there's a, an argument that comes out of our book, uh, which Charles Godfrey uh, puts, about the need for sustainable intensification. In other words, we need to grow more on less land, but in a way that will not allow the land to degenerate over time. I'm just not an expert enough to know what the relative relationship is uh, between the organic and chemical um, fertilizers uh, in that. So I'm, I'm sure you're the expert and know more about it than I do, so I'll pass on that. <laughs> Before we take another question, will you just um, show the book? So oh, yeah, sure. You can know what it is and just explain, presumably, so the this, on the shelf of back there. Yes, so this is the edited volume that I'm talking to. Uh, it's Is the Planet Full? I'm the editor, Oxford University Press. It just came out in July. Uh, and it's got, as I mentioned, 10 chapters. And it's, I think, at Blackwell's uh, just down the road here. And also, I, I understand that Blackwell's has a, sh a special shop somewhere for, I think, at the Maths Institute for the, the alumni event. And it'll also be in the OUP shop on the high school. Yeah. absolutely right um, to highlight uh, the importance of rules, regulation and question of who makes them. The, the final chapter of the book which I wrote is called Governance Matters Most um, and it is about governance and one of the, the tensions that's arising is that while the system requires more and more coordination, not necessarily at the global level, in system, at a system level, um, the global system is totally unfit. I mean, we're stuck in a Westphalian system built for a completely different world at the national and the global level. Uh, and so we see it really incapable of addressing many of these commons uh, problems. And some of them, and I think the previous uh, talk was on cyber, are just orphans of the system. There's no global management of that, as there isn't for migration and many other things. And some are competent, like WHO, but are highly under-resourced in their capacity and highly over-politicized uh, in the way that they uh, achieve their mission. 
to, to think, help us think this one through, I convened a wonderful group of people into something called the Oxford Martin Commission for Future Generations, which Pascal Ami, the outgoing head of the World Trade Organization, chaired, and people like Michel Bachelet and Amartya Sen and many others uh, were part of. And we produced a report last year called Now for the Long Term. Um, which is on our website. It's had 1.2 million uh, downloads, which is pretty good for a, an academic sort of report uh, from 171 countries. So there's quite a lot of interest that it's touched. And we try and think of new solutions to manage these global, global problems, which aren't, you know, it, it, I got all these people, they're not representative of the next generation, but they're very representative of very experienced people that have tried to make the system work uh, Trichet, the head of the European Central Bank, was another one of many others. So we don't call for world parliament and peace, um, as, as attractive as a proposition as that might sound. We just think about new ways of doing things, and we come up with this idea of basically coalitions or creative coalitions, which can be business, civil society, some countries that are prepared to move, and we see that in many, many areas. We see it on oceans beginning, we see it with cities coming together on climate change. We see it in new ways about how different actors can actually move these things forward. And you don't need everyone to be there. And some of these things are very simple. For example, on antibiotics, we just not need to stop using them in animals. Well over 50% of antibiotic use. And we need to insist that over-the-counter sales stop around the world. They have to go with medical prescriptions. So some things don't require you know, everyone to act. It doesn't really matter what Rwanda does on antibiotics, quite frankly, but it really does matter what the US and China do. Um, and so the idea that you get the, the actors that are really going to affect the outcome to be part of an agreement. Uh, and I think that, and that can indeed, and that I think defines who the we is. It's we that can shape the outcome. Thank you. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> Thanks very much, Doctor.